Hi, good afternoon, teachers and students. Welcome to your second workshop session of our 24th Annual Board Boy Conference. Uh, for those of you who haven't already encountered me at some point during this conference, my name is April Julian. I am the Director of Education for CCLA. Thank you for joining us. We have another fantastic talk lined up for you, but before we begin, I just want to remind you all um, that there is an option to participate, to send your questions and your comments. We will have time at the end of the session for our guest speakers to address your comments and questions. Um, you should see whether you're on a mobile device or your desktop, a little button or a bubble with a question mark in it. If you click on that, you should see um, a chat, a little box where you can submit a question or comment. So please feel free to participate throughout. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you're thinking and the questions you have about anything we're talking about today. So please uh, avail yourself of that option. So I'll start off by telling you about our fabulous guest speakers today. We have joining us uh, Gabriel Aladwa, who is a former migrant farm worker from St. Lucia and now an organizer with Justice for Migrant Workers Collective. Uh, and we also have Shane Martinez, who's a Toronto-based lawyer who litigated the first successful human rights case of a migrant farm worker in Ontario. He regularly represents migrant farm workers on a pro bono basis as part of his work with the Justice for Migrant Workers Collective. Now, as you know, Gabriel and Shane will be speaking about the reality endured by migrant farm workers in Canada. Before they begin speaking, They've asked me to show you two videos which depict the living conditions that some migrant farm workers have to contend with here in Canada during the pandemic. They ask that you please pay close attention uh, as you watch this video and ask yourselves, would I be willing to let my loved ones live in such conditions? And here to tell us more about uh, migrant farm workers and the story behind the food we eat is Gabriel Aladwa. Gabriel. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel, as you heard. I'm a former migrant farm worker. I want to tell you that on the 16th of October was World Food Day. And that's what brought me to Canada to, to harvest your fruits and your vegetables. And during this year, during the pandemic, we've been encouraged to stay at home. And it's especially at that time when we are asked to stay at home, we tend to think, people tend to think more about food. Where is my food coming from? Is the, um, if, I, if, I have, if I have to stay home for a long period of time, for three months or more, will my food supply be interrupted? You know, we, we are really concerned. And that is what I want to, uh, both my colleague and I want to tell you a little about. But to tell you about, to tell you about um, the ex my experience as a migrant farm worker, I want to tell you in the form of a story, right? Uh, to start off my story, I want to tell you that I have a nice rope. I think I have a nice rope in my hand. My father was arrested in, in my home country for stealing a cow. My father said one day, he never stole a cow. He said one day he was walking home and he saw a really nice rope. He decided to drag that rope home. It's a good thing my colleague is a lawyer. He can defend me. <laughs> he decided to drag that rope home, drag the rope home. And when he got home, he decided to check the other end of the rope. Can I check the other end of my rope? Well, let me see. He said he checked the other end of the rope and he saw something looking like a cow. So he said he never stole a cow. He saw a nice rope. He decided to drag the rope home. And when he got home, he checked the other end and he saw a cow. But Today, do you really want to hear about my father's story or my story? And as, I, um, as I'm as i about to tell you my story, I want you to take your shoes off 
And I want you to put yourself in, in the shoes, to walk in the shoes of migrant farm workers and see the story, see the conditions that are associated with the fruits, the vegetables, those fruit and um, food that migrant workers harvest, that put th those food that we put on your table, try to figure out the conditions and tell me whether they represent fair and just conditions. So my story, my father saw a rope, but I was forced to pick up my rope. And what are the things that forced me to, be, to, to pick up my rope? I want to tell you, when it comes to migration, people travel, once you travel freely, you're tourists. But when you're forced to travel, you're, 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 um, that's what migrant workers are. They, we are forced. And we, these are the three simple things that forced me to come to Canada. WTO, the World Trade Organization, and that is one of many institutions, international institutions, global institutions that were really in place to basically create the wide divide that forced people to, to become unemployed. I was forced to come to Canada because of ED, environmental destruction. What are the countries causing global warming and climate change? What are the ones paying the price? The developed countries really cause a lot of the pollution and we are the ones paying the price. I, am, I was forced to come to Canada because of a hurricane. I was forced to come to Canada because of GI, global inequality. Don't we have sufficient resources? Don't we have sufficient resources in the world for everybody's need? But because of global inequality, that is why I was forced to come to Canada. When I came, when I arrived in Canada, I got something at the other end of my rope. <clears throat> and the other thing, the other thing I got at the end of my rope, I got something looking like this. I got a telephone number. I'm pretty sure you've seen that telephone number. And I also got another thing. I got something looking like this, a tree. I want to tell you that the program that brought me to Canada is like a tree. The program that brought me to Canada is like a telephone number. Let us deal with both of them. The first number in my telephone number is 54. The program that brought me to Canada, the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, this year is 54 years old. That program started in 1966, that's one. In the telephone number, the other number I have is three. This three in that telephone number are the three simple parts of the tree, the stem, the branches, the leaves. I am in Canada because of the stem of that tree. What is the stem? I am here. That program that brought me to Canada, the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, which is 54 years old, is there because of the stem. What is the stem? We are here to do jobs, Canadians do not want to do. And what are the jobs we do not want, Canadians do not want to do? They are all the D jobs, the dirty jobs, the difficult jobs, the dangerous jobs. That is why we're here. And all of these D jobs, they are non-unionized work. All the difficult work that we do, they are non-unionized. Can you imagine the working conditions associated with non-unionized work? The branches, the second pillar of that pro program is the branches. In Canada, being a migrant farm worker, we cannot apply for status. And what is status in Canada? What is status in Canada? What does status really mean? Status is, status is, what does status mean? In Canada, if you do not have status, you do not have rights. And over a hundred years, Canada continued to use two things on just immigration laws and on just labor laws. These two things to work in tandem, on just immigration laws and on just labor laws to keep migrant workers vulnerable and precarious. Not having status, not having status means we are denied basic human rights. Not having status in Canada means we are denied basic labor standards. So we are here to do those difficult jobs and not having status. What does the LEAVE stand for? We are, by the federal government says it fit to tie us to our employer, not by a contract, in addition to a contract, we are tied to our employer by way of a tied work permit. We have a closed work permit. So let me go over that. We are tied to our employer by way of a tied work permit. We are denied basic human rights. We are denied basic labor standards to do dirty work. To be tied to your employer, to do the dirty work, and at the same time, you are denied basic human rights and basic labor standards. That's the program that brought me. That is the program that brings people to harvest your fruits and vegetables. Is that a fair program? Is that a just program? As you can see, this is not a just program. And as a result of that, I've counted at least 20 injustices that migrant workers face in the production of your fruits and vegetables. 20 injustices. Before I tell you about those 20 injustices, I want to tell you when you look at, when you look at the, food, the food chain from the seed 
all the way to your table. From the seed, from planting all the way to your, to your plate, to consumption. Look at the different activities. A lot of peas, the planting, the picking, the packaging, the processing, the preparation. The, the, when you plant the plants, we have to care for it. And the distribution, all of those activities that take the, 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 the seed and the plant from the seed stage all the way to your plate. The planting, the and picking, packing, everything along the food chain. It's people of color who does those work. But under what condition? Here's some of here's some of the conditions. Some of them. It's all people of color. We all get minimum wage. We do not have status. We work long hours. Language is a barrier. Uh, we are non-unionized. Remember, we, we, we are not unionized. There are lots of myths. Um, there's so many, so many, so many injustices. But let me tell you, as a migrant, a former migrant farm worker, let me run through the 20 injustices that we that really stands out in my mind. And tell me whether this represents fair and decent working conditions. One, we are tied to our employer. Remember, we are we are not only tied by our contract, we are bounded to our employer because of our work permit. It's a closed work permit. One. Number two, we cannot apply for status. What is status? Not having status in Canada, we don't have status. It means that we are denied basic human rights, denied basic labor standards. We, the farmer controls our housing. And as you saw at the starting of the, the presentation, the conditions of our housing. What are some of the conditions? One, we live in overcrowded bunk houses. Two, a lot of the time they are below standard. Three, they are isolated. And a lot of times they are not, they are not regulated. Number four, we have contracts, our contracts are not enforceable. Number five, the threat of deportation keeps us quiet. That is why you do not know much about um, the story behind your food, because there's a threat. And what is the threat? Our employers control the travel agency that books our flight in and out of Canada. The moment you speak up, it's so easy for them to book your flight out of Canada. So that threat of deportation keeps us quiet. Let me go to number six. We face harassment and racism. That's a given in Canada. Number seven, we are often denied minimum wage. Often denied minimum wage, and we are denied overtime pay. We do not get overtime pay. Is that fair working condition? Number eight, we work in dangerous jobs with very little or no protections. And if you watch Migrant Dreams, which is a documentary, it would highlight um, some of the injustices that we face. So um, some of the conditions associated with dangerous working conditions. Number nine, we do those dangerous jobs, but yet still when we get injured, with very little protection, we do those jobs. But when we get injured, it's so easy for an employer to send us back home and replace us. Medical repatriation. Number 10, not one inquest into work-related deaths of migrant workers. Not one inquest. Um, on the 1st of November, we had an activity to, um, to we had a vigil um, to commemorate the lives of all those migrant workers who've died as a result of work-related accidents in Canada. And there's over 100 who've died from 1966, over the 54 years. Even this year, at least three migrant farm workers have died in Ontario as a result of COVID. Not one inquest. Number 11, the, why is that so? The labor laws excludes us. The labor laws excludes us and they're not responsive to our issues. Number 12, the few rights that we have in Canada, the, the labor laws are not being enforced. The few rights that we have, they're not being enforced. Number 13, we pay into EI and we can't, we cannot access EI, employment insurance. We cannot access it. Number 14, of all the 20 injustices there, you can put all of them together. None of them will come close to, to number 14. To be physically separated from your family, the people that you love, that is the worst injustice all migrant workers face. And in Canada, we fight two wars. Every day we fight for better working conditions. And on the other hand, we keep worrying about our families back home. To be physically separated from your family, your mind can never be at peace. How can you ever give 100% when your mind is not at peace? Number 15, why is that so? Because of unjust immigration laws, unjust Canadian immigration laws and policies. For over 100 years, from the time of the Chinese railroad workers, Canada continued to use unjust immigration laws and unjust labor laws to work in tandem to, to keep us vulnerable and precarious. Number 16, can you imagine that? We have to pay to work in Ontario. We have to pay. These are jobs Canadians do not want to do. And take this year, for example. 
This year I consider it to be the best stress test. Why? What I mean by that? Unemployment is at its highest in Canada during this year because of COVID. Unemployment at its highest, that's the best time for Canadians to fill up those slack, so to take up those jobs. And yet still, yet still, Canadians still do not want to do those jobs. And yet still, we have to pay to do those jobs. Can you believe that? Number seven. Illegal for migrant farm workers to unionize. Remember, I told you we do non unionize work. Can you imagine the working conditions? Number 18, why is that so? Power, so much power is in the hands of our employer. The contracts, everything, the, the program is designed to please the employer, and there's nothing in there for the, for the workers, right? So it is, there's so much, there's high power imbalance. Number 19, Canada, on the world stage, Canada tells the world. That is a champion for human rights. But up to now, Canada has failed to sign the, the International Convention of the Rights of Migrant Workers and their Families. Up to now, Canada has failed to sign it, to ratify it and implement it. Number 20, migrant, the, the group that Shane and I are affiliated to is called Justice for Migrant Workers. We are grassroots. We, we are not a union. We are a grassroots organization. But yet still, the government does not want to consult with us. Are these fair conditions? Are these just just conditions? They, no, they are not. I want to, <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Eh? That <clears throat> in Canada, in Canada, the fruits and the vegetables that you have, it's presented to you in such a nice way. It's called buy local. You want to think of freshness. You're supporting the local economy, and you, uh, when you think of freshness, you think of good health. And that is packaged in such a nice bag. I hope my bag is full of glitter, right? The buy local is such a glitter thing. But I want today, I want to open that bag with you and examine what is the story behind your food. I want to tell you, you know what Canada wants? from the sending countries. Canada wants the sending countries to send people of color, people of brown, people of black, people of color. That's one thing Canada wants. What's the second thing Canada wants? Canada wants those people of color to be either illiterate or English is a second language. The third thing Canada wants, people of color, English is a second language or the illiterate or the third thing, they are ignorant. Canada wants those people who are ignorant about labor issues and human rights issues. Canada wants those people that can be easily exploited. People, the more ignorant you are, the easier, the is easier it is to prey on your on your ignorance. And that is what the sending countries, um, that is what Canada requires of the sending countries. What happens when these people arrive in Canada? Canada would welcome us in a climate of fear. Remember one, one element of fear, just one, there's so many. One element of fear is the threat of deportation. That keeps us quiet. There's fear built in that. One, they would welcome us in a climate of fear. Another thing, to keep us compliant, to keep us compliant, they pay us minimum wage. They keep us isolated. They, remember, we, we, uh, we don't know much about the human rights issues at all. We live on the farms. We are isolated. So these are all issues. They're all issues to keep us compliant. And what happened? Where is that happening? Is that happening in the USA? No, it's happening in Canada. What about Canada? Canada is known as a country of silence, a culture of silence. Everybody's quiet. Everything is okay in Canada. Everything's quiet. That is happening in the quietness of Canada. And what is happening? Is that an illegal program? Is that an illegal program? No, it has a full blessing of government. It has a full blessing of government. So my question to you, who are the politicians loyal to? You, the worker, me, the voter, or the donors? Who are the politicians loyal to? And you can see that program is not in favor of the worker. It's in favor of the donors. And, and that, is what, that is what we are fighting. So in closing, in closing, I want to tell you a couple of simple things. Some people see the world as a place that can supply us with all our basic rights, our basic needs and necessities. And some people see that the world as a loan from our children. And when we hand it back to our children, we want it to be a better place. Some people see the world like that. But other people see the world as a place to conquer it and exploit it. When I look at, when I look at this flag of Canada, red and white, in my country, red and white means love. In my home country, on two occasions, I've felt the love of Canada, on two great occasions. 
in my home country, red means danger. When I look at this red leaf, it reminds me daily of the 20 injustices that migrant workers face, migrant farm workers face in Canada. And that is what my group is fighting against. We're fighting against unfair working conditions. We're fighting for decent working conditions. And at this point in time, because of time, my colleague Shane will be highlighting some of the injustices. Because of time, we can only touch on free housing and some other issues into more detail to draw your attention to those conditions that are really inhumane. And these are the real stories behind the food that you eat. Uh, the, the complete story is the complete stories are usually not told. And now today, that is our job. That is what we're trying to do, to tell you the complete story behind your food. And I need to tell you before I pass you on to Shane, that the more removed that we are from, from the soil, the more removed, the further we move away from the soil, the more disconnected, the more, the more disconnected we are with the issues of our food. So before I pass you on to Shane, I want to ask you that question. Are you concerned whether your food is being grown by those who respect the soil, respect the environment and respect the workers? Or are you not concerned whether they exploit the soil, exploit the environment and exploit the workers? So now I pass you on to Shane to, 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 to go into more detail with some of the issues. Thank you. All right, Th thanks very much, Gabriel. Uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna focus in on some of the issues that, that Gabriel spoke about, and I'm gonna elaborate a little bit on uh, some elements of the program, which uh, you know, in, in our respectful view uh, need to be changed urgently. And I'm gonna explain why it's essential for these aspects of the program to be changed, and also why providing migrant farm workers with a method of obtaining permanent residence would help alleviate a lot of these issues. So as, as Gabriel talked about, uh, the program, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, it's been around now for 54 years. Um, it's been around, as you mentioned, since 1966. Nearly all of the fruits and vegetables that are grown locally that you and your families consume they pass through migrant hands at some point during that process. They're grown or harvested by migrant farm workers. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, understandably, probably a lot of you are not aware of because when we look at the media, when we look at advertisements, when we hear about good things growing in Ontario, we don't actually see photos or videos or representations of migrant farm workers what we see typically are images of farm owners and their families um, who are very different than the workers who are actually growing and harvesting the food. Typically, they're people who are white and they're from small towns in Ontario and they own multi-million dollar businesses, which are these agriculture businesses, these farming operations, but we don't see the workers who are actually doing the labor. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to try and explain uh, and demonstrate to you using four arguments why providing migrant farm workers with permanent residence can help alleviate uh, the injustices that are very much rooted in this program. So the first one is something that Gabriel touched on, which is separation from families. So workers that come over on the program are typically in Canada for eight months out of the year. Uh, so imagine being away from your family for eight months out of the year, and then imagine doing that over and over again for many years and sometimes many decades. Some of these workers come to Canada for 15, 20, 25, sometimes 30 years they've spent here in Canada. So they've actually been here longer than they've been in their home countries. Uh, they can't bring their families with them when they come to Canada under the program. Uh, and what happens is that we have these situations arise where workers and their spouses and their children have this prolonged separation. Uh, and although the financial support is positive, although workers can send money back home, the distance really does take a significant toll on the development, especially of parent-child relationships, but also of relationships between spouses. And you can imagine what it would be like to be away from your parent for, uh, for eight months out of the year. Gabriel was talking about that being, in fact, you know, really one of the worst parts of this. Now, what we know is that by providing permanent residence, allowing people to, you know, take root here in, in Canada and be able to stay uh, and build a life here and have the rights that you and I have, 
that would allow families to uh, reunite. It would allow for family reunification. And what, one of the things that that accomplishes is that it helps us achieve an outcome that is in the best interest of the children, right? It allows children to be with their, with their, with their parents. And Gabriel was mentioning as well that, you know, this uh, international convention, which is usually, it's a type of an agreement between countries. Uh, and so there's a convention called uh, the International Convention for the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. So that's something that's developed by the United Nations and countries within the United Nations, and it's put together uh, in an effort to try and have countries around the world agree on how we should address situations like this. Now, that convention, it encourages all the people that sign it um, to recognize that family is the natural and fundamental a group unit of society and that it should be entitled to protection by society and by government and that governments should take appropriate measures to ensure that families of migrant farm workers are kept united. Okay, But this convention, as, as Gabriel mentioned, it hasn't been signed on to by the Canadian government. Right, So we have to ask ourselves why that is. The second thing that the second problem that can be addressed by allowing migrant farm workers an opportunity to have permanent residence here has to do with their housing. Right? So workers who come to Canada under this program, they have to live in housing that's provided by their employers. Now, this housing is usually on farms uh, or it's very close to the farms. And that's in very rural areas where they're disconnected uh, from the nearest towns or commercial centers, shopping areas. They're nowhere close to those. Um, so they rely on the you know employers to transport them into town if they need to do banking, if they need to buy food uh, or other types of necessities. And this kind of reliance can really create an enhanced vulnerability in those working relationships where there's already a power imbalance uh, between the employer and between the workers. Now, what we've also seen is that the pandemic has revealed um, that you know there's the housing conditions that workers contend with can be very uh, very problematic. What you saw before we started speaking uh, was uh, was a video, two videos in fact, of housing conditions that migrant workers have, have suffered here in Canada during the pandemic. One of the videos that you saw showed mattresses laid out on a, a concrete floor on, on top of wooden, uh, wooden pallets in a warehouse, and that's where the workers slept. And then the other uh, clip that you saw, what you saw was uh, a bunkhouse area with uh, bunk beds that were crammed together and only separated by thin pieces of cardboard. So you can imagine trying to live in the middle of a pandemic crowded into a tiny place with so many people and all you have is a thin piece of cardboard keeping you separate. Now, apart from there being issues with COVID and the transmission of COVID, what we also know is that uh, there's potential fire hazards when you don't have proper housing in place. Um, back in 2016 in a town called Brantford in Ontario, um, there was a fire that broke out in a bunkhouse that migrant workers lived in and they lost everything. They lost all of their belongings and a lot of them actually lost their money as well because they weren't keeping their money in a bank. They were getting paid, they were cashing their checks, at, at check cashing business, and then they were just keeping the cash on them. So the workers lost everything in the fire, uh, and it's not the first time something like that has happened. Um, now in Ontario, uh, housing for seasonal agricultural workers, migrant farm workers, it's exempt from the provisions of a law that's known as the Residential Tenancies Act. So the Residential Tenancies Act is a law uh, that um, sets out your rights as a tenant. So someday when you go out and you're renting an apartment, or let's say that your parents are renting one right now, their rights um, and entitlements are set out under that law. They're, what they're guaranteed in their relationship with their landlord is set out there. So they're able to have that kind of minimum standard and guarantee of uh, quality of life in, in the unit that they rent and pay for. Uh, migrant workers, however, because the housing um, that's provided to them uh, is conditional uh, upon them being employed at a farm, um, they don't have that same protection. The law says that if you're a, a farm worker and you are living in housing that's provided by your employer, you're not covered. Okay? So permanent residence, again, that would enhance uh, worker mobility and autonomy because it would allow them to live somewhere that they choose to live instead of a place that they're being forced to live through a contract. 
The third issue um, that I'm going to touch on and, and how permanent residents could help address that uh, has to do with workplace abuses and, and repatriation. So migrant farm workers are, in fact, regular targets for abuse and exploitation. There's been many cases of this. Uh, sometimes the abuse is uh, racial abuse, as was seen in the case of Adrian Monroe's. Um, that was the case that April had referred to as being the first successful case of a migrant farm worker in Ontario. Um, we litigated that case back in 2013 at the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. And what happened there was that uh, Mr. Monroe's uh, is a migrant farm worker who is from St. Lucia. And he was sent back home to St. Lucia after he complained about uh, one of his managers using racist slurs against him. Okay? So they tried to get rid of him. They sent him back to St. Lucia. He managed to get back to Canada, which was quite exceptional. And we were able to do that case on his behalf. Other times the abuse can take other forms. Um, uh, there's a case from 2015 called the Prestige Foods case. And in that case, um, two sisters from Mexico were sexually harassed and also sexually assaulted by their employer. Um, that was a very uh, serious case um, there. Um, and it's another example of the types of abuse that can occur at farms and greenhouses where migrant farm workers are employed at. Other times uh, things can happen, such as racial profiling by the police. Um, there's a case that's going on right now at the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario involving a DNA sweep that was uh, conducted by the Ontario Provincial Police in a place called Tilsonburg. Um, what happened there was that uh, there was a crime in the community. The police went out, they started taking uh, DNA swabs from migrant farm workers in the area, whether or not they match the description of the suspect, because they were racialized people, they have people who are black or brown, they decided to target in on them, um, despite the fact that they may not have matched any of the other description of the suspect that they were looking for. So there's a human rights case that's uh, happening right now about that. Now there was also a case during the pandemic not too long ago about a worker from Mexico um, who had his employment terminated after he spoke out um, about uh, COVID uh, being spread in the workplace and health and safety issues there. So whether it is uh, racism, sexual assault, racial profiling, speaking about, about you know, health and safety issues, um, there's a lot of risks for migrant farm workers. There's a lot of things that make their working conditions unsafe in many of the workplaces. Uh, and what we know as well is that sometimes the way that some employers try to deal with that uh, is when workers speak out is that they repatriate them. Like in the case of Mr. Monroe's, they send them back to the countries um, that they're originally from. Um, other times, uh, the, the ramifications can actually be worse than even being sent home to the country that you're from. Uh, sometimes workers die. A worker named Ned Peart was crushed to death on a tobacco farm near Brantford back in 2002. Uh, two workers died at a place called Phil Singer's Organic Foods in 2010 after they inhaled toxic fumes at a place that made uh, apple cider. Um, and then there's also vehicle accidents. A lot of times we'll see vehicles that are overcrowded with migrant workers. And in 2011, 11 migrant workers died from Peru. Um, here in Ontario after their vehicle went off the road. Um, also three migrant workers, as, as Gabriel mentioned, died this year here in Ontario. They were all from Mexico and they died from COVID-19. Um, there's never been an inquest into the death of any migrant farm worker. The government has never said, we're gonna look into the circumstances that have happened here through a, what's called a coroner's inquest. And oftentimes there's a culture of fear that pre prevents people from speaking out. Um, they live in silence because they're afraid that they're going to be sent home if they say something that might make their boss unhappy. Um, so permanent residents, again, would effectively remove that vulnerability that they face because it will it allow them to have stability here. They'd have security here. They'd have that safety to be able to speak out and not worry about being sent home where they couldn't provide for their families. And it also facilitates access to justice as well, which is an important thing to consider. If somebody is sent back home, it's very difficult for them to access the court system here and to access remedies. The case of Mr. Monroe's was very exceptional, but oftentimes when people are sent home, they never have a chance to have their case heard in court. They never have a way of fighting back. But by having permanent residents here, they can actually better access and utilize some of the legal mechanisms that may be available in Ontario. 
and it allows them to participate in a meaningful way in civil society at large. They can become a part of the community and they don't have to feel as though they're living on the, the margins of society. And then finally, um, it really comes down to a matter of dignity, this question of permanent residence. So if somebody is good enough to work, it stands to reason that they should also be good enough to stay in Canada. If they're willing to do work that Canadians are not willing to do, uh, they should have the option to stay here. We enjoy the literal fruits of their labor every single day when we buy local produce at the grocery store, fruits and vegetables of so many different kinds. That is the hard work, the blood, sweat and tears of migrant farm workers. They risk their lives oftentimes doing this work. Farm work is some of the most dangerous work here in Canada. And they sacrifice the relationships at home with their families as well. They endure conditions which are really unimaginably difficult, ones that, that we, Gabriel and I have outlined for you today. And they do not deserve to live in isolation and invisibility for this. Uh, so again, it comes down to this question of basic human decency and compassion for our neighbors. And this sense of compassion should you know, move us to call for their inclusion in our communities. And by doing that, we'll be able to take very valuable steps towards fully respecting the immense contributions that they make to us uh, in our collective communities. So thank you very much. Oh, April, I think you're on mute. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, I thank you both um, for taking the time to um, share your experience. Uh, I will open up um, some time now for our student audience to ask any questions uh, about what they've heard so far. Um, just, I guess, as we're talking here while we're waiting for, for questions from the audience, um, I wonder if you can share either of you um, any resources that uh, Justice for Migrant Workers uh, have that might uh, give our student audience some tools to think about or to use um, to support uh, the rights of migrant farm workers. Gabriel? Shane, would you like, oh, Gabriel uh, or Shane, who would? <laughs> Gabriel, would you like to talk about the toolkit? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for this great opportunity. Yes, um, would um, April would it be kind enough to share that link um, sure. to the audience with the audience? Yeah, in that in that link, there's several actions that you can take right from your phone to to pressure to pressure the politicians and um, authority people in power by sending an email, making a phone call to your MP. Um, using Twitter. There's so many little things that you can do right from your phone. You do not have to leave your home to take action, to basically take action to create a food system that is healthy, that is sustainable, and that is just. If you're concerned about a food system that is reliable, that is healthy, sustainable, and just, here are some simple things you can do just using your phone. And the, um, the link that will be shared um, with you, uh, uh, there's lots of simple but powerful tools that can uh, push the, the authority to, to create a fair and, and better society. Thanks, Gabriel. I wonder too, I know you had shared earlier that you were obviously a former um, migrant farm worker, but now you have PR status in Canada. Is that correct? Ye yes, I do. So that from my, is that, that's a rare result for, from what I understand? Yes. So can you tell us about that that journey and how how that happened for you? Okay. Um. Yeah. Thanks for this opportunity. Yeah. It is a very, very, very rare result. Um. It's a long story, but let me see how short I can make it. First of all, I said the three pillars of the program. We are here to do those dirty jobs, and we cannot apply for status. So how did that happen? I cannot apply for status under that program. How did that happen? And um. Strange enough. A long story short. Strange enough. I I. I befriended somebody who was, um, who was having a garage sale, befriended that person. That person ended up giving me a radio 
and I have it right here, but it's a it's a little distance. I don't want to move away from the camera. I have the radio, and that is that that because of that radio, that is why I am in Canada. Because of that radio, uh, one morning I was listening to a program, and uh, it was in 2016, 15, 16 there about, where um the, the government of the day they were uh, passing legislation um where th there's a different program. Uh, we call it a four in four four in four out where the government that that program the, it's a different program to the seasonal agriculture workers program under that program the government is saying once those workers the workers on that program once they've spent four years in canada they have to return to their home country spend four years before they can return so on uh, one morning before going to work i was listening to that program and i and i heard um it was a lawyer an immigration lawyer on the program and I said to myself, if that law is good enough to be on the radio, she must be good enough to work something out for me. And that's how it started. It's because of a radio, that's how I'm in Canada. But to, the other the other things are, um, I had some really interesting friends. Because of that same friend who gave me the radio, I was able to connect with an OPP officer, um, a Monty officer, and I got nice support letters from churches and so on. And that's how, so it, it was just like a miracle that happened. And to make it worse, oh, more interesting, the route that I used to apply to for permanent resident, it was a very narrow, very, very narrow. One out of 10, the possibility of getting it is one out of 10. The chances of getting it for one out of 10. That was a very narrow, narrow road. And what was that? HNC, humanitarian and compassion. It is it is based on the person, the person or people um, going through your file is based on their compassion. Nothing else, right? It's just on somebody's mm -hmm. compassion that decide whether you stay or not. And and that is a very the chances of getting through is very, very narrow. And it just happened. I was I up to now I consider it to be a miracle. Mm -hmm. I, this is a question in a nutshell. No, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that personal story with us. Um we have some questions that have come in. Uh so I will I'll read them out and perhaps um uh, you let me know who would be best to respond. So the first question, um has there been any sort of speaks to what the story has shared, but in general, has there been any progress towards achieving residency status for migrant workers? And the second, why has the option to opt out of Canadian law, that is labor law, facility standards, etc., been allowed and not challenged? So perhaps these are uh, questions, Shane. Um, would you be able to field those? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I can answer these. And Gabriel, if you have anything to add, uh, we can do that. Um, <clears throat> so with respect to the first one, uh, there hasn't been a significant amount of progress. Um, the government has uh, indicated that they're willing to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, kind of uh, test, test programs, right? Like pilot programs to see if uh, it may be appropriate to create a pathway for migrant workers to apply for, per for permanent residence but in a very small reduced setting, right? By just, uh, for example, using like a single farmer and uh, saying, you know, we're gonna per perhaps allow a couple of your workers to make an application and see how that works out. Um, but we, what we have to remember is that there's tens of thousands of workers on this program. Um, there's not really any conceivable reason why it should be rolled out in a slow way. Uh, you know, again, especially if you've been here for a long time, I don't know what the hesitation is really there about, except that there may be some sort of a benefit in keeping people, as they say, permanently temporary, right? Um, and now with respect to the, the second one, uh, why has the option to opt out of Canadian law been allowed? So it's not so much that Canadian employers who employ migrant farm workers are opting out of the law. It's that that's the way that the law is designed, right? So a thing about the law is that the law is not accidental, right? The law is very, it's a, it's a creature that is very intentionally developed. Uh, nothing in the law is a mistake. It's not as though, oh, oops, you know, these workers don't have rights. We better fix that. Um, laws are very carefully created. Um, many sets of eyes look at them. Many people approve them. And there's reasons why those inequalities exist is because oftentimes if there is a detriment to somebody, there's a corresponding benefit to someone else, right? So when a person is not allowed to have the right to speak out or is not allowed to have particular rights in a certain area, oftentimes someone benefits from that and that relationship of power. So these situations where Canadian law doesn't seem to apply to migrant workers, um, that is the design of both the law 
and the contracts to which, which which govern migrant workers' lives here in Canada. And I'll just briefly explain that the, the contracts that this, you know, that run this program, they're negotiated by three entities. They're negotiated by the Canadian government, the governments of the countries that the workers come from, and also an organization that represents the employers. Okay, that represents these corporate farms that employ migrant workers. Who is not at the table negotiating the contracts? The workers. Okay, and if we look to, let's say, Ontario, for example, in Ontario, farm workers are not allowed to unionize. The courts have said that they're not allowed to. And you can maybe ask your parents, you can say, hey, are, mom, dad, are you, are you in a union? And they may tell you yes. And you can ask them what the benefits of that union are, right? The protections that they have, the benefits that they have, the safety and security, the good pay. Migrant farm workers and farm workers in general don't have that in Ontario because the government has intentionally carved them out of that. And that's not a mistake. That's something that was done on purpose because the agricultural industry, the farming industry, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, holds so much influence and power over the government that it has the ability to ensure that laws are developed in particular ways that benefit it and disadvantage the workers. Um, I wonder if you can also tell us, you know, as our, as our student audience is thinking about all of this, I know we have the resource up there for them to look at in terms of action. I know when we're thinking about, um, you know, buying vegetables and going to the store, is there any way in terms of um, our purchasing power that we can have an influence? Can we make informed decisions about where we purchase our foods or, or know more about maybe who are the uh, producers who have um, practices that respect the rights of farm workers? Is that something that we can, we can know and that we can do? Put our money towards that as well? I think money talks in a lot of ways. Can I take this one on? Absolutely, um, please. Yeah, um, I want to compare to the U.S. Uh, I attended a few sessions in the U.S. In the U.S., there's that there's that um, a similar um, action, and it's called the good food policy, where they pressure the, the 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 big giants to pressure them. They pressure them to buy foods from farms that you know basically respect their workers, treat their workers fairly, respect the environment, and so on. But in Canada, that's a common question we I keep coming across, and Canada is a little maybe lagging behind in that. However. However, there's something which I've not done much research on. It's called the, the fair trade. Fair trade, and generally, the policies are generally fair trade means to deal, um, to trade fairly, treat the soil fairly, treat the workers fairly, treat, you know, treat people along the chain fairly. But I've not done much work on that. How do they, um, how much influence they have on the market? I am not too sure. But there's that, there's that little influence from fair trade. Uh, but at the end of the day, everybody wants a food system that's healthy, I'm pretty sure, that's sustainable and that's just. We want that. But what do we, how can we get that? How can we get that? We can pressure the politicians because they are the cause of the Shane just told you that these laws are not there by mistake, right? And they are the ones who carve them out. Mm -hmm. And we can, there's power in our hands as a voter. There's power in our hands as a consumer. But it's the politicians we need to, to, to pressure. Because the 20 injustices I try to highlight, they are at every, every, every level of government. So these are the people we need to apply the pressure to, to, to ensure, to deliver to us a food system that is healthy, sustainable, and just. Don't tell me that if there is only one place that's selling a healthy, sustainable, and just food in Ottawa, that you'll go all the way to Ottawa. We want a food system that's across the country, regardless where you live. So that is what we want. And it's the politicians who hold the lock or the key to that lock. For sure. Thank you for that. So. I think we're nearing uh, close to the end of our time here. So uh, I'd just like to thank you both again for sharing your work and your own personal experiences with us. I know uh, for many people um, in this session, perhaps the story behind their food really only goes far as far as the grocery store. Um, and Shane, as you mentioned earlier, if it does go beyond that, we have sort of this image ingrained in our heads of an idyllic farm, you know, with a single farmer waking up at the crack of dawn to tend to their fields and we don't see all the the workers behind that 
Um, so I think your your talk, both of you joining us here today, has really opened all our eyes to the real social cost um, uh, behind the food we eat, uh, borne by our migrant farm workers, and particularly now with this pandemic, when we we you know are are rallying to thank our essential workers, migrant farm workers surely belong in that category and deserve the adequate supports and protections uh, against their exploitation. So. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. You've given some uh, uh, some actions that we can potentially take. Um, so thank you for giving us a clearer and more accurate picture of the story behind our food and also um, what we can do. So thank you both again for joining us. Thank you uh, to the audience here for joining us uh, for this particular session. Um, we will share resources with your teachers. We'll share this um, this recording with you so that you can continue to think about these important questions and the different actions you can take. So thanks all of you. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow for the final session of our conference. Thanks everybody. Thank you.